My name is Reverend Lisa Yadoa, and I serve as the lead pastor of the Southeast Raleigh Table. And we are so grateful that you have felt compelled, led, to carve out a little bit of space to come and to be in this particular place for worship. There are so many ways that we might spend our time on a Sunday morning, and yet to come to do this dangerous and good and beautiful work with people that you know and some people that you do not know to trust others with maybe your cries or your tears, to trust others with your prayers or your confession. It is no small thing on any given Sunday morning when you choose to do this collective work called worship. And for those of you who are gathered here in this space or who may be joining us via Facebook Live, I pray that you will not take it lightly, um, your presence wherever you may be. But I also pray that you would not take it lightly, God's presence among you. This presence that doesn't push us, but sometimes convicts us. This presence that stretches us to a place of growing, but not to a place of breaking. I pray that you would stay aware of God's presence this day. For this God who says that God is good, comes to do good things in us and also through us. I had this moment this past week where um, it really hit me that, wow, we have been living in the midst of a pandemic for two years. And I tend to count the time based off of what happened or didn't happen in the life of the church in the midst of a pandemic. And what I have just come to realize is that a two-year break of not waking up at a certain time on a Sunday morning and showing up and standing here that I now feel very unpracticed when I am in worship. Some things do feel very new to me. And I imagine that when you come into this place 22 months later, that there's some things that also feel new to you as well. That it takes a little more energy to sing the words. It takes a little more energy to pray the words. It takes a little more energy even to process and to keep your hands open for the gift called communion. Here's what I would pray that we would, though, ask God to help us to never be unpracticed in. That we would never become unpracticed in anticipating that God can do something wonderful in the midst of worship. That we would never become unpracticed in trusting that God comes among us to do a good work within us. That we would never become unpracticed in believing that there is a stirring in this place. So this morning as we worship God in spirit and in truth, maybe you cannot sing. Maybe you just have no words to pray. Maybe you don't feel like having to do all the fellowship every day. Then might you just hold on for just a bit for the next 55 minutes Saying, but God, the, the thing that I'm going to I'm going to do is I'm going to trust. And I'm going to keep myself open and available. That there is something you want to say to me this day that might bring forth life. Maybe so as we worship God in spirit and in truth, that we would practice having anticipation for what God is able to do. Let's worship God in spirit and in truth. Chasing after you is the name of the song, but we're chasing after our God who 
for the love that you have poured out on me have not felt so lovable. For the peace you have offered when we would rather sit and grow in conflict. Oh God, you are good and you are greatly to be praised. And you're worthy of every single thing that we might ever say from our lips and the raising of our hands and even the prayers that we pray with our feet. Because you are such a good God. God, we ask that you would help to remind us and to stir up within us an awareness of your goodness. That when your glory is moving among us, that our eyes will not be closed to the miracles that you are performing right in our midst. That God, you keep us open and available to your presence among us when we feel as though we have been left behind, and yet you are nearer to us than even our next breath. God, that we would keep ourselves open to your goodness and to your presence when you send community and people and family and friends and sometimes strangers who are like angels unaware. That the work that we cannot always see with our human eyes, that God, we might sense you are stirring in your work with your kingdom eyes. To know and to feel and to experience that you are good. God, this day we can listen to you all of the places in this world that feel other than good. We can list all the places in our lives that feel other than good. So our prayer to you this day that your goodness might be unleashed in ways that healing, peace instead of war, reconciliation instead of conflict, abundance instead of scarcity. God, help us to have the courage to believe that you are still with God who is at work and that you cannot fail. So this day, whether we can believe or trust the words, we've already sung the words. That God, you are Alpha, you are Omega, you are Beginning, you are End, and that you're worthy of all praise. God, would you show us in this world, would you show us in our lives that you are worthy of all praise. We ask all of this. These prayers said, these prayers whispered, in our hearts, in the strong name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. If you have been with us here at the South East Raleigh Table for the last two weeks, you know that we are in what is known as the season of Lent within the Christian calendar. Lent is the 40 days that lead up to the season of Easter, uh, where we basically take a journey with Jesus to the cross. It is a season that is oftentimes uh, set apart by uh, spiritual practices like prayer and reading scripture and self-reflection and also to self-examination. Last week we talked about the practice of confession, what does it look like to be honest and to name the places and the ways in our lives that we have not lived up to the God goodness within our lives. And today we're going to talk about um, this really beautiful and very powerful spiritual practice called self-examination or known as the examine. 
Now, what um, I uh, what I realized though, um, and what I want you to know about these spiritual practices that we will lean into, these practices that help to build up our personal piety, is that it is not to bring about like some spiritual elitism through the season of Lent for us to get to Easter and say, oh, look how moral I am that I've done all of these things for this 40 days. But instead, we understand that whenever there is inner work being done, it will affect the ways in which we show up and also to how the world um, is changed. Because changed people, in turn, create a changed world. If, if I learn to recognize that um, I am seduced by power over, as opposed to power with, over the 40 days, it is going to affect the way that I'm in relationship with other people. And if I renegotiate the way in which I spend my resources, it is going to um, renegotiate uh, and also change the way in which we understand scarcity or abundance when it comes to distribution of resources. So these 40 days of doing this inner work, it's not simply so we can say, look, I have not eaten chocolate, and now I'm like, oh, hi. That is not what the 40 days are to be. These 40 days are to recognize a holistic transformation that happens within us and also that will be reflected beyond us. What I also realize in the season of Lent is that there's often this assumption that we're all like versed or adept in spiritual practices. That when we say things like, oh, this is a season of prayer, this is a season to, uh, to, to anchor yourself in scripture, this is a season for, uh, for self-examination, this is a season for confession, that all of us just like uh, assume that, oh, we just know how to do these particular things. And that's not always the case. But these practices of confession and repentance, of self-examination, of reading scripture, of, of, of prayer and fasting, they are important because they give us a framework for how we might be shaped in the ways of Jesus. Now notice I didn't say they give us a formula. They don't give us a formula, they give us a framework for the ways in which we might be shaped in the ways of Jesus, that we might look like Jesus, that we might ask ourselves, like, what draws me closer to Christ and also to what are the ways in which I feel like I'm far away from the presence of God. So I want to talk um, in depth about one of these spiritual practices that helps us to be more aware of God's presence in our lives, but also helps us to be aware of ourselves, of our brilliance, and also aware of our brokenness. So that we might recognize where we need to be changed, so in turn, the world is also changed. I need to share that this, uh, this sermon is very much anchored in uh, a spiritual practice that, you know, is about 400 years old called the Examine. But I was inspired by the teaching of Father Michael Sparrow, who is a Jesuit priest. And so I want to just say that I stand on his shoulders um, this morning as I offer about this sermon. The other is that I am not going to be preaching to you. I'm going to preach with you this morning. Which means that um, if you feel so inclined to take notes, that is a way that you might preach with me this morning. Or if it's just simply that you ask, uh, you are hearing the words or the invitation or the instructions around the examine being shared with you, that you begin to think, okay, how might I make the word flesh Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? So it doesn't mean that you have to always talk back to me, though. I love people talking back to me in the midst of worship, as long as you know we're typically agreeable with each other. Please know this is not me telling you a whole lot of things. We preach with one another. I, too, want my life to be changed so that this world might be changed. I want your life to be changed so that this world might be changed. We don't preach to, we preach with one another. So here are all these words from Luke chapter 15 that might help us to understand the beauty of self-examination and also self-awareness. This story, which is quite popular of the prodigal son, begins in verse 11, and it reads as such. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. 
The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, I'm going to say that one more time. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. But then he came to himself. You know what's the most popular line in a breakup, or at least I'm assuming this is the most popular line in a breakup, which is, it's not you, it's me. Which I don't necessarily think people really mean when they say it. <laughs> because when I talk to a lot of people after a breakup, they usually have a long list of reasons as to why they were breaking up separate ties, no longer tethered to the person that they're walking away from. But I do think it sounds really nice and very courteous to say, no, 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 it's not you, it's me. But again, knowing myself, when I'm really honest with myself, I realize it is actually easier for me to scour other people's lives and to assess and analyze other people's lives, what I think are their failures, what I think are their brilliance. And sometimes it's a little harder for me to turn inward and to assess where I might have um, not shown up well. How I may have um, actually kept us from being able to move uh, forward in not just relationship, but in life in general. Self-deception is, I think, one of the great temptations in our lives. And I think self-deception is such a temptation in our lives because we want to hold on to a particular version of self where we don't feel ashamed, where we don't feel uncomfortable, where we don't sometimes even want to be stretched or groomed. I get it. Sometimes self-deception feels like it is a means of self-preservation. I don't want to say out loud that the reason why I'm always so clingy in my relationships is because I feel so lonely. Who wants to say that out loud? You are so impatient with the people that you live under the same roof with, but you're supposed to be like, oh, I love you, honey. Oh, I love you, honey. But I'm so impatient with them that even sometimes when they're breathing too heavy, I wonder why, Lord. <laughs> Who wants to confess that being mean to others through humor is the way that you protect yourself?
word transformation. I like using the word change. I like using the word new creation. I like using the word letting go of old stories. I like saying all of those things, but I really do love to experience those things. But change and transformation, letting go of old stories and holding on to new stories and being a new creation only comes when there is some means of self-reflection, some, some level of self-awareness in our lives. Socrates once said that an unexamined life is not worth living. Father Michael Sparrow says this, though, an unexamined life cannot lead to growth. If we never pause and stop and take stock of our lives, if we never look back at the patterns that hold us hostage or keep us from being our most patient selves or most gracious selves or most at home selves, if we never sometimes take stock of that, with some reflection, some awareness, our growth will be stunted. Now I realize, um, you know, we say in, in the Christian tradition a lot of times, like, don't remember the former things or consider the things of old. See, I'm doing a new thing. Like, don't look back. Don't rehearse old history. And, uh, and uh, yes, okay, uh, what, what we don't want to do is get in a pattern where we're so bound by the past that we get stuck in the past. But there is something to say about sometimes looking to the past to recognize how God might show up for us in the present that we might lead new lives in the future. If, if the past is a, a means of like collecting something that might help you to like live more beautifully, oh, that, that's not a bad thing. So we have to then turn down the volume on the voice of the accuser, the evil one, Satan, however you want to name that which is not the goodness of God. That will sometimes say, but if you look back or if you reflect or if you stop being so busy and actually just, you know, get still and sit with the thing, we have to turn on the volume on the voice of the accuser that will say, but no, 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 but if you do it, you're going to get stuck there. Or, or as soon as you reflect and you start to bring up all these things in your life, that maybe that's just who you are. Got to turn on the volume on that voice that would make us fearful of saying, okay, what do I need to do that I might self-reflect and become more self-aware if it is the means by which I am changed and also transformed. Because sometimes when we look back, we also get to rehearse where God has shown up for us and what God has done in us. I am not my 16-year-old self. Thanks be to God. <laughs> so when we look back, we recognize all of the moments that we were being issued invitations into new life. Sometimes when we look back and we take stock and begin to recognize the people who came alongside us to co-labor with us in our growth. Sometimes when we look back, we recognize the folks who were cheering us on, the folks who challenged us, the folks who spoke about who we might look like if we were living or bumping into our best selves. We also begin to realize some of the folks we had to let go. Reflection is an on-ramp to growth. Reflection is an on-ramp to being more at home in ourselves so that we can be at home in the world. I would also say that self-reflection and self-examination helps us to be just in ourselves so that we can also be just in the world. It's an on-ramp to transformative justice. If I do not interrogate, you know, the things within me, then I will never know the power that is wielded beyond me. Self-reflection, self-awareness, self-examination, the examine, they help us to be yoked to growth. So I want to remind us of this, uh, this example of examination in scripture. Here we have the story of the prodigal son. This son, who before his father has passed away, basically says, Father, you're taking too long to die. I don't want my part of the inheritance. I mean, that's basically kind of the, the tone of this particular passage of scripture. 
And this father is gracious enough and gives the younger son the part of the property or the inheritance that he was going to receive once he passed away. And it says that this son goes off to a distant country, meaning like far off from being at home. There, there's something also metaphorical about going far, far away. And it says that he uses all of this money for dissolute living. He makes it rain in all the wrong places. <laughs> The unfortunate thing when he spent all of this money is that there's a famine in the land. So he has put himself in a fragile uh, uh, place and now he's also uh, living within an insecure state because um, everyone has great need. And it says that, you know, he hires himself out to a citizen. Now, notice like the relational difference. This father who loves him, who gives him something now, he goes to this citizen, this unnamed person who's going to make him work in the fields with the pigs. That's also something to be said. These unclean animals, he's got to go work with them in the fields. And it says that as he is feeding the pigs in the fields, he is noticing the pods that they are eating and wishing You are in a desperate place when you see stuff coming out of a pig's mouth and you're thinking, oh, <laughs> you're hungry. And maybe this prodigal son is thinking to himself, how did I get here? Maybe this prodigal son is like, this isn't me. Maybe this prodigal son is reflecting on all the times that his father was so generous of spirit and he could not see the generosity of spirit. While he is in this very desperate place, it says that the son has a moment where he comes to himself. But then he comes to himself. It's a moment of recognition. It's a moment of acknowledgement. It's a moment of awareness. It's a moment of self-knowing. Like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here I am in this far distant country, wishing that I could eat the food that the pigs are eating. And here's the thing, with my father even, his hired servants would never have to live like this. Would never have to live like this. Now the beautiful part of the story is that the son picks himself up after he has this moment of recognition, of acknowledgement, of self-reflection, and he goes on basically going to beg his father to receive him back at the father sees him from a far distance and hugs him and with compassion. I mean, it is a beautiful story. He gets more than he deserves. He gets more than he deserves. But friends, I don't want us to hold on to that moment when he has, huh, he comes to himself. And it's at that moment of reflection, that moment of awareness, that moment of examination, that the son makes a shift in his life. These moments of recognition and awareness are not fleeting. They sometimes can be the difference between life and death. I don't necessarily mean that physically, I mean that in regards to like life that is really life. And life when we're on autopilot. And I need to remind you that this world that we live in is set up to sometimes keep us distant from ourselves and this, this level of awareness. It keeps us too distracted. Or sometimes our pride keeps us too resistant. To stop and to reflect on, wait a minute, is this me? Is this me? And then to make some shifts in our lives. So we have to have practices in our lives that keep us aware and help us reflect. 
flex the, mu the, the muscles of awareness, that we can also then flex the muscles of examination, and that we can also keep ourselves open and available to the presence of God stirring us and speaking to us that we come home to our best selves. And so this is when you're going to preach with me. Because the great way to look for God's presence or to be aware of God's presence in our lives and also to be aware of the things that might keep us stuck or that might move us forward is this 400-year practice that has come out of um, St. Ignatius of Loyola. It's kind of called the Ignatian Examen. E-X-A-M-E-N. It is a prayer-filled mindfulness practice that keeps us aware of God, that keeps us aware of the things in our lives that maybe we need to move away from or also maybe add so that we and our self-examination and our self-awareness can move in ways that we look more like Christ. It's a technique of prayerful reflection on the events of our day in order for us to make some shifts, or for us to celebrate, or for us to let go, or for us to hold on. It's a way of taking stock daily so that we might have those moments where we come to ourselves, where we slow down just a bit, to come home to ourselves. Now, some would recommend that you would spend about 15 minutes doing the exam on any given day. For some, 15 minutes might feel way too long. For others, it may not feel like it's a long enough time. I would just simply say, I'm going to invite you, if you practice the exam after this Sunday, that you would at least start with 10 to 15 minutes. So here's how the exam is framed. Generally, there are five parts to a daily exam. The first part is becoming aware of God's presence. So, you know, you probably want to be um, in a quiet place or space, in and, and a, and a place where there's not lots of distractions. But during this part of the exam, you might invite God's presence among you. You might literally say, you know, Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. You might become aware of your breathing. You might ask God to help me to see beyond what you can actually see. That you might hear God's voice. God, help me to see you. God, help me to sense you. Literally, that you begin to speak or, or settle yourself. Or like, I just want to become aware of God's presence. You might think through the day, God, you are God who has not failed me. God, you are God who has shown up for me. God, you are God who has given me good things. But you become aware of God's presence. The second part of the exam is to review the day with gratitude. Or as we sometimes like to say here at the Southeast Raleigh Table, to rehearse God's goodness and then give thanks. This is our, our foundation for our relationship with God is gratitude. So think about all of the ways in which you have been kept. That you had three meals, that you had a great day at work, that you enjoyed a great biscuit. I mean, just rehearse, like remember that the things that are the simple pleasures, the things that fill your heart with a level of gratitude. Next with the exam is then to pay attention to the emotions or the feelings that rise up within you as you review the day. Were there moments when you were incredibly angry? Who made you angry? Did you feel a tinge of resentment when you were in conversation? Has this just been a day where you felt a lot, or maybe you felt alive and aware? Maybe you felt energized. It could be positive or it could be a, a negative feeling that rises up within you. Just don't let it pass you by. But be willing to face whatever that feeling or emotion is that comes up for you as you review your day. The fourth part of the exam 
is to choose an aspect of the day or maybe a place that you consider to be a shortcoming or a place you consider to be a success. And when you land on that, that thing, that, that moment of the day, pray about it. So maybe it's a moment of success that you might be like, Lord, in that moment I felt like I was using my voice in right action. Frame it as a prayer of thanksgiving. Maybe it's, you have someone in, in your life who you cannot stop thinking about them and they are ill. Maybe it's going to be a prayer of intercession like, God, I pray that you would be, you'd be present with this person. I cannot stop getting this person's you know, um, situation off of my heart. Be mindful of whatever that thing is, that aspect of the day, whether it's something you want to celebrate or something you need to let go of or something that you made as a shortcoming. And as you pray about that thing, that is your way of also like uh, uh, wholly releasing it so that you don't get stuck, especially if it's a negative feeling or a negative part of the day. This is not your moment to self log It's your moment to be, become aware and then to turn it like, God, I want you to hold I want you to hold this. This is where I've, 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 I've had a moment of acknowledgement or awareness. I've come to myself in this moment. And God, I want to offer it to you. And the last part of the examine is to look toward the next day with hope. Today, I feel like I was not at peace at all in my life. But tomorrow, God, you are shalom. Today, I may not have celebrated my wins the way that I needed to celebrate my wins, but tomorrow, I'm going to be my greatest cheerleader. Look, look towards the future with a sense of hope. Speak how you want God to show up for you and how you also too want to show up for yourself and for others. Some would say that it's at this part of the exam that you would talk to God like a friend. Like, this is what I this is what I want, this is what I'm hoping you would talk to God as a friend. Friends, an unexamined life cannot lead to growth. And here we've been given this beautiful season in the life of the church. That by prayer and confession, repentance and self-examination, we might be made more in the likeness of Jesus. May it be so that as we stop to pause and to reflect, that we might have moments that we come to ourselves and make shifts that lead to life. We pray with me. In the quiet of this moment, O oh God, would you speak to us? Would you reveal and unearth? To be self-aware and also where you are calling us to be aware of your presence. In the quiet of this moment, oh God, would you help us to be unafraid of the stuff?
stillness and the silence. that we might be at home in these moments of examination and awareness. God, settle our hearts
Friends, there are two ways in which we respond to God's love here at the Southeast Raleigh table. One is by offering up our gifts and our tithes and our offerings, literally offering up our, our monetary resources to God. Also to offering up um, the gifts that are within us, that they might be unleashed in this community and also unleashed in the world. That's one of the ways in which we, um, we share our gifts. And when um, you are invited to come and to receive our communion this day, for those of you who would like to offer your tangible gifts, um, you can do so by placing them in the second basket in the trays that are here at the front of our worship space. But the other way in which we receive and respond to God's love is by coming to Christ's communion table. Recognizing that we have done nothing um, to have to hustle or deserve uh, God's grace, but that this table represents God moving toward us, coming toward us, offering us good gifts in the places of our lives where we may not feel so good. In a little bit, I will share with you how it is that we'll come and we'll receive communion. But first, we anchor ourselves in a story that reminds us of the goodness of, of who we are, not by the world's standards, but by a God who creates us in God's image. This God who is worthy of all honor and glory and praise created us in God's image that we might look like the divine. But when our love failed and when our love was not steadfast, God's love came toward us. God became like the hound of heaven pursuing us that we might be made more like God. God spoke to us through the prophets. God anchored us in God's story of salvation. And because of this, we rejoice. We give God all honor and glory and praise. And then we know this one who is the liberated Jesus, who proclaims good news to the poor, releasing the captives and recovery of sight of the blind, to set at liberty all of those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when he would save his people. Jesus healed the sick, he ate with sinners, and he fed those who were hungry. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, he gave new life to the church and also invited us to have new life in Christ. And so we ask that the Spirit of God might be poured out upon us, gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the cup. That they might be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, so that we might be the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with each other. And by your Spirit, make us one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes and find our victory. And we feast. And Christ heavenly banquet. We ask all of this in the name of the one who creates, redeems, and sustains. And all God's people say, Amen. Friends, on the night when Jesus Christ gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to his heavenly Father, broke the bread, then gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Friends, this is a sharing in the body of Christ. And when the supper was over, Christ took the cup and gave thanks to his heavenly Father, then gave it to the disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This is the cup of joy, the cup of salvation. Friends, here's how we take communion here at our South Israeli table. One, this table is open to all. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't even have to understand all the theology of the communion table. If you simply want to be in love and relationship with God and with one another, come and receive these good gifts, knowing that these good gifts make something good of each and every one of us. You'll come by the direction of one of our volunteers this day, by the middle mile, and you'll find that there are baskets here in the front. There's a small communion kit for those who come to the left-hand side or right-hand side. For those who come to the left-hand side, you can take one of the communion kits. And for those who need allergen-free uh, hospitality, you can come to the basket here in the front. I will offer up words over you as you come to receive these elements this day. If for some reason you would rather not take communion, you can simply place your arms across your chest, and I'll offer up a blessing over you. Once we have all taken one of the communion kits and you go back to your seats, 
we will then take communion together as a church family. Friends, come taste and see that God is good.
before we go forth from this place, I want to just share with you um, a bit about um, how it is that we might go forth from this place faithfully. One, if you are visiting with us for the very first time, we are so grateful that you have come to be among us here at the South Australia table. We want you to know that we don't consider you to be a stranger or a visitor. We consider you to be family member and a friend. And we do hope that you will come and join us again. You'll notice at the back of our worship space that to the right there's a glass room with coffee and also some pastries from our friends at Black Allergy Coffee. There's also some information where you can find out more about the South Australia table. There's a QR code that will link you to our newsletter. You can also introduce yourself by uh, filling out one of our introduce yourself cards. And that is a way that we can get to know you a little bit better, but also too, we can tell you how we are showing up in the world and how we would love to show up for you. Also in the classroom, we have one of our Lenten um, kind of exhibits. It's of a, a visual painting and also of a poem from a poet here in our community named Al Slane. The visual painting is of an artist who is based in Houston and also Richmond. Um, her name is Lenicia Rouse Tinsley. And you might just stop and like, take a little bit of time uh, to look at that as a, as a means of orienting and also grounding yourself. If you would like to, if you go to our loop, um, our newsletter, you can find that visual and also the poem there that you can use for your devotional time during the Lenten season. The really exciting thing that we have coming up here at the South East Raleigh table is that on Thursday, March 31st, at 7 o'clock, we are going to be gathered here in the sanctuary for a book tour and launch with two of our friends out in Seattle, uh, Reverend Gail Bantam and Dr. Brian Bantam. They have written a beautiful book called Choosing Us, Mutual Flourishing in Marriage in uh, a World of Difference. I just want you to know that Gail and Brian are amazing, absolutely amazing. They are absolutely amazing. We would love for you to come and be a part of this moderated conversation that I'm going to have with them. This is not a book just solely on uh, marriage or covenant, but it's really a book to help us all understand what it looks like to have faithful relationships with one another. So we do hope that you will carve out some time and invite friends to come and be a part of that, uh, that moment on March 31st. I wonder if I'm going to stand as you were going to Friends, as you go forth from this place, may you go being aware of God's presence. But also, too, might you be aware of God's presence at work in your life. That you who are changed might also see a world that is changed. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen.